Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming today. So today's webinar is on therapeutic presence. My name is Chris. I'm a therapist here at Sierra Tucson. And many of you are probably like me in that it's kind of a no-brainer, this idea that being fully present with clients and patients and people in our life is a good idea. And that's part of what excites me about this topic is that it's rather obvious in a certain sense, um, but it's really profound the more you get into it. I'm not sure that we always have the vocabulary to talk about it, and I think that we're not always aware of the literature out there on the subject. Um, it's one of those things that can be kind of taken for granted or kind of, we might even feel pressured to say that we're always fully present with clients, um, but we all know that we're not exactly. So I'm coming to this webinar from a spirit of being excited to explore this with you today. So it can be fun to start with a good quote. And so I'd like you to take a look at the quote and image on your screen. And one way to start thinking about presence is this idea of those meaningful pause moments that we sometimes have with clients and patients. Um, it might be that they've touched on something real and profound and then veered off into a cognitive distortion or something tangential. And we get tempted to react to that in a certain way, but we maintain our presence. They perceive us doing something and then they kind of catch themselves um, doing something. The second part, part of this quote is from Rollo May is that we're choosing which direction and which approach to throw our full weight behind. And when May talked about things like that, he always meant our full weight mind, body, emotions, and spirit. So you might also consider asking yourself a few questions as we proceed with this webinar. On what is my therapeutic timing based? What does it feel like to me and to patients or clients when I am rather distracted or bored during the encounter? And what does it feel like and what sort of impact does it have on them and myself when I am fully present? We're going to cover today the idea that therapeutic presence is the hub of the common factors in psychotherapy. We're going to clearly define it, talk about some challenges to it, how to prepare the kind of soil in our life so that it can happen more often. We're going to talk about interpersonal neurobiology, and I'm kind of excited also to talk about some therapy outcome research on the subject and some ways of formally assessing our level of presence. Sprinkled throughout, we're gonna explore some exercises and tips together. The common factors research in psychotherapy is it's a respected body of research. They've done large meta-analyses of the different major therapeutic approaches. They've shown that overall therapy is pretty effective and that the different approaches are pretty equivalently effective at the end of the day. There's common factors that are going on in all the approaches when they're most effective that may explain more about why therapy works than the unique techniques of the given approaches. So things like therapeutic alliance, the bond, how strong does the client feel the relationship is, and how is the working alliance? Uh, empathy. Therapists that are rated by outside objective raters um, and by clients as being higher in empathy that can feel alongside the client, that can feel something of where, what they're going through and can accurately express that in a way that the client accepts, those therapists have been found to be more effective. I'm not gonna go into all of these that you see on the screen. Each one of them could easily be the subject alone for a webinar. Schneider proposes that therapeutic presence is the hub of the common factors wheel, makes all of them possible, makes all of them work better. So if you think about it, how strong can your emotional bond be with a patient if you're rather distracted or bored or overly preoccupied with your own cognitions about the client, preoccupied with the idea of whether you're doing a good job or not? The same with empathy. Um, how can you accurately show empathic understanding if, if you're only present um, with a part of yourself, like your cognitions? Oops. Sorry about that. 
So we have to clearly define presence, of course. There's a lot of great definitions in there. This PowerPoint focuses on, uh, is largely, um, you know, shows a lot of respect to Geller and Greenberg and Schneider's um, work. So Geller and Greenberg proposed that, again, it's about bringing your whole self into the encounter, which we'll talk more about what that even means. There's a sense of being fully grounded in the moment in our highest values. Um, we'll talk more about that. It's about being immersed in what is most poignant in the moment with the client, an expanded sense of awareness or perception, and being really fully with and for the client. Kirk Schneider has, I think, kind of a philosophical, poetic definition that I like. Um, you'll see throughout this webinar that some of this is gonna be very concrete and kind of tips. Some of it can get a little, it's abstract, it's philosophical, which I kind of like. So Schneider talks about that presence has a holding function and an illuminating function. If you look at the picture on your screen, you can see in the foreground that the water is kind of gently lapping up against the verdant earth there. There's a little bit of a sense of a nook or a sanctuary of some kind. You go a little bit further out. I don't know why these keep changing. You go a little bit further out and you can see that uh, there's a beam of sunlight illuminating another part of the water where it starts to meet a larger body of water and a less sheltered body of water. So Schneider talks about this holding function of being fully present. We're holding a, a sacred space, a sanctuary, um, emotional safety, trauma-informed, empathy, those types of things. There's a holding function. There's also an illuminating function. So presence not only helps clients to feel safe enough to explore some of the more difficult aspects of their experience, but it also shows them something. By you being present, it shows them something. We're not gonna have a lot of time in, in this webinar to go into kind of techniques and what that means, but if you could hold kind of loosely in the palm of your hand, this idea that presence has a holding and illuminating function. What are we holding and illuminating? That which is palpably significant, that you can feel in your body and emotions, that's kind of what we're holding in the encounter, not just what the client says and what we think about what they say. We'll return to this in a moment. So throughout this PowerPoint, we're gonna take some pause moments together. Um, this comes from Geller and Greenberg's work. So if you could just let go of any thoughts for a moment and really look at this picture in front of you. Take in its intricate details. Now allow yourself to take in a small detail, whatever stands out to you but notice it with great curiosity and interest. Now close your eyes and visualize that image. Hold it in your mind's eye as well as you can. Pay attention to the details and any visceral sensations that might come up in response to the image. Now slowly open your eyes. Look again at the image as if it was the first time you're looking at it. Notice it with fresh eyes and curiosity. Thank you for doing that. Let's go on. So therapeutic presence appears in a lot of the major theoretical approaches. We're not going to have time to go into each one of these. But if you look at the person-centered approach, you know, it's a humanistic approach developed by Carl Rogers. Rogers talked about the three therapist offered conditions that are necessary for clients to grow to self-actualize. They are unconditional positive regard, which Rogers did say was kind of an ideal that you can't perfectly uphold and that authenticity backs it up, but unconditional positive regard, empathy, and congruence. When Rogers talked about congruence, he talked about what he called the organism. So what you feel emotionally and physically in session with clients that has to integrate well with your self-concept, your ideas, and what you express. So you can't be feeling something physically and emotionally, stuffing it down or ignoring it, trying to think something else about yourself or the client, um, and then saying yet a third thing. There has to be more integration. So 
Rogers later in his life started talking more and more about presence. He started saying things like, you know, when I'm at my best as a therapist or group facilitator, I'm closest to my inner intuitive self. And when I do that, my presence alone seems to have some kind of a releasing effect on the client. The existential humanistic presents a lot of ways of doing this with clients, being present and helping them to be more present in their experience. It says that presence is really the ground, the foundation, and the ultimate goal of that type of therapy. Mindfulness embraced approaches, of course, mindfulness is a system and a science and technology for enhancing our ability to be present. So challenges. One I'd like to discuss briefly is a lack of presence with others in our daily life. So a friend of us calls, uh, a friend of ours calls, they're venting about their job. We feel some type of physical discomfort we don't quite pay attention to. We're getting a little bored and irritated. We start scrolling through our phone. Um, hopefully that works out. They might get annoyed with that. We end the call. Uh, that's an example of kind of just not really be fully being fully where we are in the moment. We're there physically on a very basic level, um, but we're not really there mentally and emotionally. So challenges when we start talking about sessions. Um, I pre-plan some of my sessions, but but pre-planning the session can really get in the way of presence. So last week your your client was you know, talking about their sister, there was a lot of cognitive distortions in there, a lot of emotional reactivity. We're good helpers and caring people. So we think about it hard. We do a bunch of research. We come up with an exercise. But then the next session, they come in and they seem to be kind of annoyed with us and they seem to be tense physically. We may, we may still need to focus on the previous issue, the planned issue that may be fine, but that's missing an opportunity for a fuller presence in the moment. Um, also, being overly attached to a perspective or a particular outcome um, or not preparing oneself to be present in the moment. And we'll talk about that more. So some tips. How do we prepare the soil of our lives to kind of be, have presence emerge more? So if one step is a philosophical commitment to it. Um, structuring our days and weeks around moments of stillness, of pause, of looking within, being intentional about our media use, uh, things like that. Before we discuss this slide, I'd like to do another pause moment with you. So if you could, please close your eyes for a moment. Take a deep breath in through the nose and out through the mouth. And please push the bottoms of your feet kind of into the ground a little bit. Just feel what it's like to feel your feet on the ground. And reflect for a moment on what your normal practice is at the beginning of a therapy day or between sessions, or if you're not a therapist or provider, uh, between meetings or between tasks, to-do lists. What activities do you do? How do you spend those few precious moments? How much stillness or kind of ritual for preparedness do you engage in? How could you add in one to five minutes before or between each activity to enhance a sense of stillness and receptivity? Okay, please gently open your eyes. Thank you for doing that. So setting an intention for presence. Geller and Greenberg did a qualitative study in 2002 where they interviewed therapists from different approaches about presence. And what they found was that some therapists had these kind of rituals. So one therapist mentioned, you know, she's very busy, booked back to back to back to back to back all day. So what she does is on the way to opening her door to let in the next patient, she says to herself, letting go of distraction, settling into presence. And then during the session, when she's starting to get preoccupied with, you know, am I doing a good job? Am I a good therapist? Is this working? What do I need to make for dinner? I'm feeling a little tired, whatever all those things that pop up. Um, she would say to herself, letting go of self concerns, uh, inviting presence. These are some ideas. Also bracketing our theories and plans. Rollo May talked about, yes, as providers, we have to read a lot, and study a lot and train a lot. But then we got to leave that at the door. We got to let ourselves 
improvise a little bit in a full bodied way, kind of like a musician might do. You know, we have our structure, we can trust that we have it in there, but let's let ourselves improvise a little bit. So how does presence actually go down? How, what is the process like? So according to Geller and Greenberg, it starts with receptivity. But again, when we're talking about presence, we're not just talking about an open mind. We're talking about your full being, not just your parts, your full humanity as a whole. Open, listening with the third ear. Um, it's not just what clients say about their issue. It's not just what we think about what they're saying about their issue. It's also the vibe they're bringing in, how they seem physically, the energy we're getting, what, how, what we're resonating with physically and emotionally. We want to expand our awareness out a little bit to include those things, to be receptive to. So once we've been fully receptive in a different way to the client, um, we can then attend inward, trust ourselves a little bit. You know, the congruence thing that, um, that Rogers talked about. You know, I'm experiencing something physically. My self-concept doesn't quite want to allow it, but I'm going to allow it, and I'm going to be a little more transparent in a certain way. Then we come to extending. So we've got, we're receptive to the client, we're attending inwardly, and now we're extending out to them. So the heart of my approach is the existential humanistic, but I am integrative. I do a lot of cognitive behavior therapy, a lot of EMDR, and I like a lot of approaches. I do think the existential humanistic approach has something to offer in terms of the relational component um, of this. So in, in the EH approach, we talk about authenticity to the encounter um, and to the context of the relationship. So when we're talking about transparency, we're not necessarily talking about just automatic self-disclosure or narcissistic self-disclosure or um, that type of thing. But I'll, I'll give you a brief example. So a client shows up and he has a tendency to touch on something real and then veer off into intellectualization. And we know that that's a self-protective measure for him. We have compassion for that, but we know that we need to work with that. So he starts sharing with you his grief over the fact that his daughter doesn't want to have contact with him anymore. And you can see it in his body and he's speaking slower and authentically and you're very there in the moment with him. And then he starts to get uncomfortable and he veers off into anger at her for not appreciating all the money he gave her and then how great he is for making that much money and how superior, superior he is and superior to his parents and all these things. And he's veering off into this. In the EH approach, we might say something like, ooh, I want to slow down and check in with you real quick. I feel like a moment ago we were talking about something very profound and I felt there in the moment with you and I felt loose and calm. And now I'm getting a little anxious and tense. I'm not sure where you went. And I'm wondering what this process just now was like for you. I could be wrong, but I want to check in on that. So it's a transparency in terms of how I'm resonating with him. And there's a sense of intuitive responding. Okay, so we talk about neurobiology. Shore talks about right brain to right brain communication in therapy as being a big part of where the magic kind of is. So that emotional, intuitive, whole picture mind connecting with the same in the client. A lot of times we can get very um, cognitive and intellectual. And I, I believe that that's when we start getting kind of bored and burnt out. It's like the client's talking at us, we're talking at them, we're trying to get them to see and think and talk the way we think they should. It's all very verbal and rational. And we're neglecting a little bit the emotional connection sometimes. So uh, it's also been shown that presence it probably helps the ability to have that right brain to right brain communication. Neuroplasticity. So it's been shown that the structure of the brain can literally change when you practice cultivating states of presence, they can become more enduring traits where it becomes a little easier to access and where you access it more regularly. The prefrontal cortex. So Siegel and others have shown that there are functions of the prefrontal cortex that seem to reflect the experience of presence. So things like um, attuned, communication. Communication that's attuned with the emotions of the other and our own emotions. Um, empathy, morality, intuition, 
insight or self-knowing awareness. Those things seem to be involved in the prefrontal cortex area and seem to involve the experience of presence. The nervous system. Ultimately, presence is a healthy state to be in. It's mostly a parasympathetic rest and digest state, but it has a slight activation of the sympathetic nervous system. So it's kind of a calm and alert state, which is kind of a, a safe state to be in. And it's a state that has um, ripple effects that are positive for overall physical health. So I'm going to skip this a little bit. Okay, so the experience of presence. It's been shown to be grounding. We feel whole. Um, and because we feel fully grounded in ourselves, there's a sense of trust and ease. Sometimes at busy um, settings, clinical settings, you know, we see one client, we bang out a few emails, we see another client, we bang out an email, another one, we go to the bathroom, we see another one. And, and we start to feel kind of ungrounded, like, who, who am I? What do I value? What is my approach? So this groundedness is kind of this we feel a little more ease in our work coming from that place of being fully grounded um, we can then immerse in what's more poignant in the moment so we can experience deeply with the client but with a sense of non-attachment so it's not a boundary violation it's not a codependent anxious attachment type thing where we're all overwrought in there with them. It's a, uh, we can experience deeply, but again, we're grounded in ourselves. So we're not attached, present centered. So like myself, like many, you know, good hearted, you know, therapists, we can spend a lot of time um, worrying if, if what we just did with the client was helpful. And if what we're going to do next is going to be helpful and all these things, um, we want to be fully in the moment in what they're experiencing. expansion so we're fully grounded we're immersed in what's poignant and we can start noticing that our sense of options of what to pay attention to is expanded a little bit um, our awareness is is a little broader um, and our quality of thought can start to feel a little better in our emotional experience as well being with and for the client so this is another one that i think can get kind of taken for granted or we might feel a certain pressure to say that we're always with and for the client, we're always empathetic, we're always present, we always have a good therapeutic alliance. But in reality, we can slip into being with and for our interpretation of the client, with and for what we would like them to do, with and for the idea of being a good therapist. So with presence, we're talking about, no, we're, we're really with and for the client. Mind, body, emotions, they're a being to be understood, not an object to be analyzed or to fit into our, that comes from uh, existential therapy, I believe Rollo May maybe said it. Um, so we see here in the middle bullet point, we can develop a sense of awe and a deeper, deeper respect, a love for the client. There's nothing boundary violation-y about that. It's platonic love, safe. Um, but let's bring some sense of awe and respect uh, for the client on a deeper level. Okay, so I'm excited to talk a little bit about the research. So I said in 2002, um, Geller and Greenberg came up with this uh, qualitative study. They created the therapist presence inventory. Um, therapists fill it out after session, 21 questions. They rate their own level of presence. There's a client version, three questions. The client fills it out about the therapist, rating the therapist's level of presence. What they showed in this quantitative study was that when patients rate their therapist, as higher in presence. Patients also experienced better outcomes. And also they experienced a better working or therapeutic alliance, which we, there's lots of research on how important that is. When therapists rated themselves as higher in presence, it wasn't necessarily when the client had better outcomes. So there's a disconnect there. They speculate on some reasons for that. It could be that we're fully present as clients, but we're not expressing it well. It could be that we're forgetting Schneider's idea that there's a holding and a safe function to presence. It's not me staring at there. I'm going to be fully present with you and I'm going to make you be present. There has to be a sense of safety and naturalness to it. It could be part of the reason. So very briefly, these are snips of the therapist presence inventory. You can see, I think on the left side of your screen, the therapist version, scale of one to seven. I was aware of my own internal flow of experiencing. I felt tired or bored. I found it difficult to listen to my client. 21 questions kind of along those lines. Some of them get very interesting. 
the, ther the client version, scale one to seven, my therapist was fully there in the moment with me. My therapist seemed distracted. These are great tools. They're on the public domain. Um, there's a references and resources section. You'll get a copy of this PowerPoint. It's a great way and an easy way to start building more presence into your practice. So in summary, presence probably requires a commitment in life and in session. It probably requires some ritual, some practice, and some formal ways of assessing it. It's been shown to improve neurobiological and other types of health, and it's been linked to um, better outcomes in therapy. Okay, so I know we covered a lot and we have some time for questions. So I am going to look over in the question section and do this. And let's see here. Okay, so one question here is, what can behavioral health care leadership or clinical supervisors do to support clinicians who are attempting to be more fully present with clients and patients? That's a really good question. I haven't done a lot of clinical supervision, um, but I do think, I mean, first of all, talking about it. I don't know that it always gets talked about. And I think maybe starting with, you know, that idea of um, the common factors and presence as kind of in the hub, asking about those common factors, you know, like how, how present do you feel in the moment? Maybe looking at the TPIs, you know, how distracted or bored did you feel? I think there's another question in there about how insecure maybe did you feel about your ability or something. Um, asking those questions, talking about the common factors, um, you know, where's your level of empathy at for this client? You know, how, how do you feel in the moment? Bringing it back to how do you feel physically and emotionally in the moment? We're a little biased in society towards the cognitive, and the thinking, um, but there's a lot more going on. So that might be one way to do it. Um, another question is, when you pick up on the client, um, just checking the time, not being ready to be fully present, how do you as a clinician still bring presence to the relationship? I think that's a very good question. So um, Geller and Greenberg did um, speculate that, um, that it can be uncomfortable for clients sometimes when you're fully present. And I kind of gave that example of, you know, if you're kind of staring at them, that could make them uncomfortable. Um, but it's also just, um, we're not used to sometimes being fully in the moment. In the moment, We're all thinking, verbalizing, you know, storytelling, narrating. And so, you know, Schneider talks a lot about um, in this existential integrative approach, you know, being fluid and realizing that clients sometimes aren't ready to go quite that deep. They might need some more cognitive work. Um, they might need to tell some stories. You know, they might be taking a strength-based approach to that um, can be helpful. And, and focusing first and foremost on just being present yourself. I mean, I use CBT. I use EMDR. I use other approaches that aren't necessarily like a purely relational approach. That um, and being present, being present. I mean, helps helps all of them. So I have one here. Um, Okay. Do you often give your clients the therapist presence inventory or any kind of satisfaction progress evaluation? If so, when and how often? Yes. Yeah, so I have started giving them the therapist presence inventory. Um, I need to get better at remembering to do it. I, I think um, sometimes I get a little too in the moment and I forget about it, but it's been very, very helpful for me. Um, and there has been times where I felt I was being very present and they thought, man, he seemed a little distracted. You know, it's kind of, oh, it's interesting. Um, and so it, it makes you really causes you to reflect and, and how do you, all of these things, you know, it doesn't help if I think I have a strong bond with the client, if they don't think I do. Um, yeah, so another question here is what evaluations do you use? So I've used the therapist presence inventory. Um, I've used a, a couple things that I've just kind of made up in the, in the past at a different agency where I was trying to ask questions about the alliance and empathy and different things. Um, there's a lot of scales out there probably on all the common factors. I know there's a lot on the therapeutic alliance um, and they're pretty cool. Um, Scott Barry Kaufman has a, a really cool one I think on, on self-actualization. 
Um, the measure that Geller and Greenberg use to measure outcomes is pretty interesting. The client task specific measure revised, which looks at um, building insight and, and also behavior change. So it's asking questions about to gauge if the client is building more insight and if they're um, changing their behavior. Cool. So I, I know we're just at about time. Um, you know, I, I appreciate you guys being here. There's a lot more nourishment webinars coming out. I'm very excited about it. It's one of the things I love about working here. Um, I'm probably going to do an hour long CE event um, on this and expand it out and maybe talk more about actual techniques or ways of doing it. And um, Yes, I appreciate your time. Thank you.